Greetings, everyone. This is the International Council for Small Business, and today's webinar it will be about David Smallbone. And we are um, delighted to have many of you attend this webinar here. And what I'd like to do now is move the slides a little bit just to get started here. I think we all have known David Smallbone for many years, and we are all coming here um, to celebrate uh, him, his research, and, and him as an individual. And the webinar um, outline or the session outline is as following. Um, we'll do some introductory remarks by me and I'll keep them very brief. And then I'll hand it over um, to um, David Smallbow and then David, David Story and then also remarks from Robert Blackburn. And then we'll open up for well wishes here. So um, with that, um, David, uh, greetings, how are you? I think I'm all right. Um, I'm but remember, it. that's only self-report data. <laughs> so um, why, why don't I just open up with you and let you just speak from your mind and from your heart about David Smallbone. I'm delighted to be given the opportunity, uh, I'm an uh, to say a few words, and hopefully it will be a few words. Um, but David Smallbone uh, was an exceptional character uh, for several of the reasons that were uh, set out in the appreciation that Rob Blackburn and I did of him. He was exceptional in the sense that he had an unconventional background uh, as uh, a small business researcher. He came uh, from uh, teaching geography at a secondary school uh, and joined uh, a um, uh, what was then a polytechnic to do teaching and suddenly almost found himself uh, alongside uh, David North as a really active and fascinated researcher. And almost everything took off from that point onwards. The combination of famous North and Smallbone pieces uh, changed both um, uh, the small business world in the UK, but also changed, I think, both those two individuals. And what then David did was having joined um, with uh, David North, a little bit later, moving over to, to Kingston to join Rob Blackburn, they really became a formidable research uh, dynamo, looking not just at the UK, but increasingly internationally. So there's a particular interest in the unfashionable area uh, of East, former Eastern European countries which nobody at the time was interested in. So they're pioneering that. They pioneer mm -hmm. also uh, developments um, uh, in, in China. Mm -hmm. And in addition to that, there's always a public focus, public policy focus on what they do. So they're really interested in what it is that governments can do to facilitate entrepreneurial activity. And that's why I think this combination of starting in one country, moving to others, all the time with a public policy focus, is the unique characteristic of, as it were, David the worker. What I think is sensible is that Rob Blackburn then can talk much more than I can about David the person. Robert, um, the floor is yours. I think you have a lot to share here, so please go ahead. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you for giving us the opportunity to uh, reflect on David's life. Um, David, well, I've asked various people um, to sum up David, and I spoke with his wife and um, his helper, Esme, who's uh, been working incredibly hard in the past, uh, since David's 
since David's death and also before she was very much part of his life. And, and, and a few things come to mind. He was very passionate. Um, if you ever um, became locked into a debate with David, you knew how dogged and determined he would be over his, over his, particular, uh, over his particular case. And I think that was shown in, certainly in the latter part of his life where uh, despite his physical ailments, he was um, incredibly um, stoical and um, you could still, still see the twinkle in David's eye, you know, he, he mentally was just as sharp. Um, but when David first came to Kingston um, in 2004, uh, he, uh, he actually came because he was dissatisfied with the environment at Middlesex. Prior to that, um, I'd run a research centre and David ran a research centre and in so, on some occasions they were competitive and I actually did come across David being very competitive on one or two occasions and there was always that streak in him if, 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 if some of you know that but at the same time he was incredibly collegiate um, David would be the he'd be the first in the office and the last in the office uh, on many many occasions he would help everyone from junior researchers um, he took great pride in um, hitting some of the, the big hitters in the area. In, in, in that way, it was very much like um, the long departed James Curran. He, he really enjoyed having a nibble at some of the big names, the iconic names. And David could also cut through um, what he would call the bullshit. And he was a very, very, um, how can I say, well measured in the sense of he had good judgment. That's one of the things one of the key characteristics of working with David. He could measure a situation and he could act, act and react and um, behave accordingly. I would never forget the times I, I also took, undertook some research with David, as some, as you, some of you will attest, and I'm sure you've got your own stories. Um, he's incredibly good fun to be with. Um, I've traveled with him. Um, Australia, we, did, we had a big project in China where we went to four different cities. Um, and David was very, very also um, adventurous. He did point out to me that he drew the line at deep fried mouse. He couldn't eat that, but he would eat most things. Um, he was horrified one day when he'd been going into a particular, uh, um, could, I suppose restaurant is, is, is being over elaborate, but going to a place to eat. I think with Roger North somewhere in Northern Thailand and they would literally point to the um, to the host as to what they would would want to eat and one day they after I think after the third day or so they said come and look come into the kitchen and choose what you want and they opened up the fridge and there was a dead fox in there and David said well I drew the line at that um, but nevertheless he was incredibly incredibly adventurous I know he's worked with a lot of people uh, throughout the whole of the world, and I think now I'll, I'll stop and give other people an opportunity to uh, share their uh, and reminisce about their experiences with David. Final point, David was incredibly professional. Um, you may have a laugh and a joke, and, um, I, but nevertheless, when it came to hard work, David, I think, was head and shoulders, and I think was a really, really good example for younger people in the profession as to how you should apply yourself. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, we, we have David, um, Professor David Kirby. Um, can you unmute your phone if possible? Is that okay, Eamon? Yes, wonderful. Let me introduce you, uh, Professor Kirby. Uh, Professor David Kirby is the holder of the Queen's Award for Enterprise Promotion He's also the former Vice President of Enterprise and Community Service. He was at the British University in Egypt and also the Honorary Professor of Almaty University in Kazakhstan. And he emailed me a couple of times and I asked him to kindly come and share some of, um, some of his experiences and, and history with David. Um, Professor Kirby, the floor is yours. Thanks, Eamon. And, and uh, I would agree with everything that Robert's just said. David was one of the... Um, most earnest, serious, conscientious colleagues I've ever worked with. Um, I go back 
with David for what almost 40 years. Um, we first met in the 1980s when I was external examiner on a course that he was contributing to at what was then Middlesex Polytechnic. And David, with his colleague David North, had produced what I thought was an extremely innovative and uh, exciting program. And certainly the students that were taking it uh, felt so as well. Um, so we talked about, it was all to do with small business and regional economic development. So we talked about this, but it was very different from anything else on the course, uh, which was, it was a geography course. It was much more mainstream geography uh, than David's and the two David's work was. Um, anyway, uh, we talked about research. We talked about publication um, and where to, where to publish in, uh, in, in business journals as opposed to geography journals. And, um, when my term finished, uh, we sort of lost contact. But then in the mid 1990s, I got a telephone call one day from the vice chancellor of what was then Middlesex University, who uh, invited me to apply for a senior management position at, um, at the university. I thought about it. I was at Durham University at the time and um, I thought about it it was an exciting prospect and then it suddenly clicked if i went to middlesex university there was david north david smallbone and another guy who'd worked um with alan hughes at cambridge and produced some seminal small business work we could actually create quite an exciting uh center and i think if it wasn't prior to robert's center it was certainly contemporary with it so partly because of david i and i decided to go to middlesex and um david was still in geography i was in the business school and it occurred to me that probably his research would be better housed in a business context than in a, a geography context so i talked to the vice chancellor i talked to his colleagues and we agreed, and we, I talked to him, of course, and we agreed that he should move into the business school, uh, which he did. And we set up uh, his research centre. And it thrived, it flourished. Um, as Robert said, it was a competitive uh, Robert Centre at Kingston. And uh, everything was going smoothly. The big problem was that David was still a lecturer. Uh, and I thought very seriously that he deserved to be uh, a professor. He deserved to have a chair. So we talked about this and um, we agreed that I should nominate him for his chair. And we thought, well, who do we get to be the external examiner? Well, the uh, external assessor. Well, at that time, really in David's field, there was only one the name possible and that was Professor David Storey. So we got David Storey as the external assessor and I don't think I've seen for a long time a um, recommendation that was so fulsome, um, full of admiration for David's work and a definite recommendation that David should be awarded a chair, which he was, I'm pleased to say. So our lives certainly in those early days, were very much intertwined. You know, I was constructive in, in um, getting him into the business school and then changing his direction. I was also constructive in uh, getting him a chair. But if it hadn't have been for him and David North, I would not have gone to Middlesex University when I did. I then left... Uh, Middlesex, but uh, I remember one day talking to David at the time I was vice president of um, ICSB, uh, talking to David, and he said to me, "What are the best conferences to go to?" And I said, "Well," and I, I still believe it. Uh, 
I would say either ECSB or ICSB conferences. So David, I believe, started to go to ECSB and ICSB and ended up as the president of both. Well deserved, um, a thoroughly conscientious colleague and an excellent academic uh, who did some extremely uh, exceptional work. I'll miss him, the community will miss him, and certainly British academia will miss him. Thanks, Eamon. Thank you, Professor Kirby. And David, I'm going to come back to you a little bit uh, based on what you've heard from Professor Kirby here is when you started working with David Spalman, some of your early recollections about David and, and the way he was approaching research and policy. I think the most terrifying thing um, that David Kirby said was that um, he remembers a reference I did for <laughs> David Smallbone. And the reason it is terrifying is that I have no recall whatsoever of writing that reference. But if it was fulsome, which is, Rob will tell you, is uncharacteristic of my references, if it was fulsome, then it was merited fulsome. Uh, because at that time, uh, David Smallbone will have done, uh, served his time on the ESRC uh, initiative and done fantastic work. So uh, I think probably um, from what David Kirby has just said, I would have been more bemused that somebody with that uh, intellect and drive was not already a professor. And that, I think, probably will have been reflected in my reference. But to, to return to the, the question you asked me, Iman, uh, uh, about uh, the early days, um, uh, if you are not British, um, you probably don't appreciate the nature of the British class system. And class is, or was, something which was very characteristic of um, the 1970s, 80s, 90s, etc. And there was this implicit pecking order of, of universities. And therefore, for somebody to come out and break the mold, to come out of what is not a university at the time, and to come out and break the mold as Jim Curran did, as David Smallbone did, as David North did, just emphasizes what we already, what we realized in later life was so special about David Smallbone. He had clarity, he knew what he was doing, he was committed and he delivered. And all of those things, as Rob Blackburn said, are exemplars for the modern generation. Thank you, Robert. I think it comes back to you a little bit here because as Professor Kirby mentioned that you and David both were competing as well, but then you also became, you know, closest friends and, and, and collaborators. So maybe you can share a little bit about your thoughts about this. I think he has his phone muted. And I think you need to unmute your phone, Robert, please. Go ahead. Can you hear me now? Yes, apologies. Um, yeah, yes, I first, I first had a, let's say, a close encounter with David Smallbone. I remember distinctly in the Barbican in 1989. And uh, this was at the beginning of the um, Small Firms Initiative that David Storey was coordinating. Kingston had been awarded a, a, a research centre position and David had been awarded a, a, a piece of funding to follow up some small manufacturing firms that he'd, he'd, he'd 
undertaken a, a previous study, maybe a couple of years ago. And David's work was quite unique there because we still we still struggle with longitudinal yeah. pieces of work, and and it, and so I think that was quite distinctive. But David, I remember I was having a conversation with someone. It was at a conference, and I was in the Barbican, and I could I could sense someone hovering around my shoulder, and I looked round, and it was David Smallbone. And, I, and so we got chatting and he, he said to me, uh, by the way, um, I really enjoyed reading your PhD. <laughs> Who reads PhDs? And I looked at him and I said, well, OK, thank you very much. And I think ever since that point, it demonstrated to me that David was also prepared to do the detail. Right to the end, David was still doing the detail. Many people in their careers, as they um, as they progress up the hierarchy, they're not they they le become less interested in detail. As I said earlier on, David would David would one minute be chairing, uh, let's say, an international board. The next minute, he would be really grafting hard on his next publication. Even now, um, I, I think Frederica might be on this call. Um, he actually was producing a book right to the end on res a research agenda for entrepreneurship policy. So my relationship with David, um, as, as, by the way, we kept using the word competition and competitive. It wasn't over awful competition. We were all in the same pool, essentially. So we did not get to know each other. But David was prepared, uh, prepared to I use the word adventurous. So he was interested in new experiences. Many, many British academics who were studying small firms didn't really go beyond their, their, their local, local scene. I think David was one of the few British pioneers that did so. And I would say that actually, if you look at entrepreneurship scholars internationally, David Smallbone would certainly hold a candle against any of them at the moment. I think that he was very, very, in a sense, very, very pioneering. I do remember one day when James Curran went to do an assessment of the research center at Middlesex. It was a university by this time. And Jim came back to me, um, and I was Jim's number two at Kingston at that point, James Curran this is. And I, he said, I had a word with David Smallbone. I said, oh yeah, what did you say? He said, well, I told him to, um, stay at home more and less aeroplane flights around the world which I thought was a bit harsh but actually that said as much about James Curran as it did as it did um, <laughs> David Smallbone they were very, very they were in the set they were very very close friends actually but I think they were very very different personalities uh, David's a lot more outgoing and Jim was a lot more introspective thank you Thank you. We do have Dr. Walter here, and if she and I'm just she's a panelist now. If she would like to jump in and say something, um, the floor is hers. Um, but but if not, currently, if we look at the the research that's going that uh, David was doing and what's happening in the world now, maybe I'll go back to um, da David's uh, story if he's available. Talk a little bit about how how it, how would David Spalbon look at currently what's happening in the world. And what were some of the questions he may ask in terms of research and policy? And just in general, what do you think he would be thinking right now? Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Um, my, my take uh, is that uh, there is uh, a clear evolution uh, in terms of what it is that, or what it was that, that David was engaged in. in he began with an emphasis upon uh, rural issues, uh, small firms in rural and urban environments, if you like, the geography focus. What then happens is that uh, he then, uh, I think, reflected in what um, uh, David Kirby said, his transition into a business school uh, meant that he became more interested in, in businesses as opposed to primarily where they were located. So he became interested uh, in uh, the factors which influence the performance of businesses. And he also then became interested in the types of people who ran or who didn't run small, new, new and small businesses. So one focus 
uh, is on on ethnicity, um, in which uh, also uh, interests me. But then it's the movement internationally. This movement, and this is why I think Frederica is very important in this, um, an understanding of the environment in which businesses operate. And that environment is policy, and that environment is the state. So David became very interested in economies which were moving from being formerly communist uh, countries to more market economy. And he's interested then in how that affects how and why and how these businesses perform. Uh, and I think if, if Frederica is, is on the line, I think she would be uniquely qualified to, to amplify uh, that dimension uh, uh, of uh, David's research. Thank you. Uh, Frederica is on the line. Uh, she'll unmute her phone and then she'll be able to speak. Okay, I hope you can hear me now. Thank you for inviting me to talk a bit. I met David um, in, I think it was in 95, at a very famous conference in Bulgaria. And since then we started working together on these projects having to do with small business in Central and Eastern Europe going on to Central Asia. And I would like to, to highlight two or maybe three points from coming actually from these projects. First, um, the network David built in Central and Eastern Europe, because that was not only a network of colleagues within these projects, but that over time, over decades, became a network of friends. And the most interesting thing for me, because at that time, David was a more accomplished researcher and I was a more junior researcher. So he started out being a mentor for me. And that is something in which he took to Central and Eastern Europe as well. He was a mentor for very many, first of all, for the more accomplished um, Central and Eastern European colleagues. He trained them, and I learned a lot through that. He trained them in survey techniques. He trained them in speaking to policymakers. He trained them in um, actually learning about small businesses. I really, really enjoyed that. But over time, kind of things changed because the projects we did, and I remember, I think we worked on 10 or 12 or 15 projects together. I can't remember how many. Over time, the whole network changed. So it was a network of like Nina in the Ukraine, Elena in Moldova, Anton in Belarus, Alexander in, in um, Russia, Urva in Estonia, um, Kirill in Bulgaria, a few people in, cen in, in Central Asia. But what we did then over time is like we roped in junior researchers. And I think that was a really, really important part of what David did, because what we did is we trained the next generation. Remember, this was, let's say, the late 1990s. So people in these countries basically had to scramble for income. They had to scramble if they wanted to remain in academia. They had to scramble for project money, actually, to stay in academia. So what we did, and David was front on that, we trained the next generation of um, researchers and I say 80% of them stayed in academia through what David did here. So that's one thing. The second thing is the policy work. Both David Story, David Kirby and Robert Blackburn have emphasized already because in all the projects we did in these countries, what was um, David was adamant on, okay, these results not only go into journals, but they basically go to policymakers. Again, this was a period where governments didn't know how to support small businesses. So what we did, we kind of educated them with our research results. And the third thing I think I also need to talk about a bit is all those stories coming with these networks and coming with these projects. Um, stories of where we had fun within this project. So besides being very serious researchers, trying to educate policymakers, actually transferring our results into policy making to a certain extent. We also had all this fun of like going onto trains together. Um, David speaking fluent Russian by the end of a night drinking vodka with Anton from Belarus on the way from Minsk um, to Kiev. And then at 10 o'clock next morning having a policy workshop in Kiev. 
Um, David sitting in Belarus, having brought um, traveler shacks from the UK to Minsk, because he actually had to bring the project money into Belarus and um, sitting there with loads of money and counting out um, something for the Moldovan colleagues, counting out something for the Ukrainian colleagues and counting out something for the Belarusian colleagues. So when I think of David, it's like he's a mentor, he's a colleague and he's a friend and he will be very dearly missed. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to bring it back to, to, to David as well. Um, and I, I want to move it a little bit here to, to, to good stories, happy stories here. Kind of like Frederica started us off with some of the, some of the David's um, uh, abilities here. So David, I'm going to leave it to you. And I'm going to leave it as general as possible to allow you to share some of the stories. Well, I think um, uh, everything uh, has to uh, has to start with David Smallbone uh, being unfortunate to be an Arsenal supporter. Um, now that uh, uh, is probably uh, alongside his family um, and his work uh, his main passion. Um, and I have to say that um, I remember uh, once uh, going not with him to watch my team, Norwich City, uh, play Arsenal uh, at their home ground. And I think Arsenal won about either six or seven nil. Uh, and um, I, however hard I try, I can't have any memory at all of David Smallbone commiserating with me uh, at that result. Um, I would say he was um, uh, bordering uh, upon effusive um, uh, at my expense. So um, when they say, uh, or when you say, can you remember something about David Smallbone? What I remember is his rotten arsenal beating us 7 0. And Robert, what about you, Robert? I'm, 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 I know you just smiled and laughed, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave it to you to share some of, some of the story, but please unmute your phone. Okay, I'll tell you a quick story. <clears throat> um, David in the bar was very entertaining and he would often hold court, but on this particular occasion, we met in central London um, to uh, celebrate the retirement of Clive Woodcock who had established the International Small Business Journal. He was also a famous um, um, financial um, writer for the Guardian newspaper. Anyway, this particular night, um, one thing led to the next, to the next, and, and I, it got to near the end of the evening. I thought, I've got to go home. So I came home and I went to bed, and the next morning I, did, I had a tremendous uh, thick head because we'd been drinking and. I even smoked a cigar that night, which I, I don't even smoke. Um, anyway, I went into work and I, 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 um, I, the phone rang and it was David Smallbone. He'd been at the same event. It was very, it, it was by, there was probably only 10, 10 people there. That was one. As, and I explained to David that um, what had happened was I'd fallen asleep on the train and really luckily um, the train, my train had gone into some sidings for cleaning. And that was right near where I live. It's probably only about three or four minutes walk. And I was very, very lucky. And I was explaining to David this story. And David, I mentioned earlier on this air of competitiveness and he has to trump you. And he pointed out that he fell asleep on the train and he only lives in North London, but he actually woke up in the Midlands in the UK. And he, he had to, in a place called Rugby, and he had to get off the train and get, take a taxi home that evening. He didn't get home until the early hours of the morning. But that was David. It was great, great fun. I also finally remember him. Um, it was his birthday and we bought him an Arsenal shirt. And this was in the early, the early, the early days of him having Parkinson's di um, disease. And um, we were at a conference and um, he put the shirt on in the bar. And we thought, OK, and a, a band struck up in the corner. And we were all chatting amongst ourselves. And then we were thinking, where is David? Where is David? And we looked over 
and he was on the dance floor with someone who he didn't even know. But that was David, he was full of life, very enthusiastic, and um, uh, he, really, by the, he really, really loved his jazz music as well. And I think it, it was that that had sort of encouraged him to forget his ailments and get on that dance floor. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'd like to share a story um, because I think um, Frederica and, and David and you started here. Um, when David was uh, president of um, ICSB and ICSB ended up having a major agreement with uh, Dell and they had an event um, in London in which they invited um, ICSB to attend and Michael Dell and uh, was in the meeting talking about small businesses and, or small enterprises. So I, I flew into London and, and David met with me and we went to the event. And in the session, I was explaining to David, I said, David, we're there, we're just, we're just gonna listen to Michael Dell talk about the small business and what they're trying to do. And then we'll talk a little bit about the work that we've done with them and we'll leave. He goes, sounds good. So we get into the meeting Michael Dell speaking, and the next thing you know, David interrupts him <laughs> and starts to correct him <laughs> on small businesses. So I'm tapping his, his leg. I'm like, no, no, <laughs> don't say anything. And he looks at me and goes, I'm talking. I'm going to let me finish. <laughs> so I thought this is going to be the end of our partnership and agreement with Dell. Right? So after the meeting, I'm like, David, why did you talk? He goes, well, he didn't get anything correct. <laughs> I'm like, I'm shaking my head. I'm like, well, I can't say much about that. I'm like, and then his team comes back. He goes, Michael Dell really appreciated ICSB's comments. And I think that picture, if you see on the slides, that was David. When, when he spoke, everybody listened. Even when he was not supposed to speak, but he did speak, everybody listened. And I, and I think... At that point, it was just magnificent. And I felt very proud in uh, being there with him in that event. And in terms of Arsenal, he did take me to an Arsenal game. It wasn't as bad, David. It was my, my favorite team, West Ham United, the Hammers. And we played Arsenal and we got beat 3-0. But uh, I think he still did rub it in very well. So just to let you know. So I now, I'm not, I, I, I think six is better than three, so I'm okay with that. And the last thing, and I'll, I'll maybe share it back with Frederica here, I made a small mistake, but it was a huge mistake. It was just before our board meeting in ICSB that we went and had drinks at the bar. And I was young and I said, I'm gonna beat him in drinking. Big mistake. <laughs> I don't remember the next day very well, but he was functioning and I was like, clouds and clouds just to get through. So I think that captures my experience with David. And I'll stop here. Federica, maybe you want to jump in and say something? Um, um, yeah. Wait. No, go ahead. Yeah. Um, um, I, I think I could go on for hours because I really have all these stories and stories and stories. And I remember some 10 years ago, I scanned all the old pictures I had and did a photo album for David. And actually, I didn't even have to put in names in there because he could simply look at one of those pictures and say, oh, that was just that project meeting. And we did this and this and this and this. There is a few stories actually which have gone with David because I can never tell them as good as he will tell them. So, and, and one of that is the story of the fireman. Um, and I, well, I think I have to go and tell you because that was the really first project meeting we had in the Ukraine. So just remember, instead of me, it's David telling this because I can't do David's storytelling. We were sitting in the hotel and there was no hotel bar. It was in the middle of the night. It was the Ukraine in 1996 or 1995 or something. So infrastructure was really basic, so to say. Um, we actually had persuaded the receptionist to give us both a beer, a bottle of beer. So something like the last drink for the night. And we were sitting there and chatting and there was the cleaning lady coming in and asking us to lift our legs. So we basically, they were trying to throw us out of this lobby and all of a sudden the door of the hotel burst open. And you know, firemen, like they looked like they came from a museum with all these old hats and with a pipe in their hands. So they came rushing into the hotel and both of us looked at each other and said, we only had a bottle of beer. 
Don't ask what we had for dinner with all the other colleagues. Yeah, but it, it, it really looked like there was a film queue probably coming in after them. But what had happened is that someone had started cooking in the hotel in one of these floors in the middle of the night and had basically raised the fire alarm. And this is why the firemen came rushing in. But we took it as a sign that probably we had had enough for that night and we basically should retire to our rooms. But this is the story which is gone with David because he was a much, much better teller of that story. Thank you. Um, what, I think we're coming close to the webinar here, ending here, but I want to give it back to, to David here, kind of moving forward. What do you think we should take away from David in terms of research, policy, some ideas that you want to say, these are things that we should reflect on together moving forward and as colleagues, as different organizations, he's with many organizations, maybe some ideas to share something that we can take with us moving forward. Thank you. Um, I think there are a, a number of, uh, of issues which um, have changed as a result of uh, hearing the contributions that uh, Frederica uh, and, uh, and Robert have made. But um, my basic take uh, is that David Smallbone, towards the end of his uh, research active life and it is very close to his death as um, uh, as Robert Blackburn made clear um, was interested in in policy and he's interested uh, in what I would call the infrastructure the state infrastructure influences uh, the scale and nature uh, of um, uh, entrepreneurial activity in a particular country. So my suggestion is that if we want to remember uh, what David Smallbone uh, contributed uh, and the topics that he covered, um, it might be sensible, Iman, to even think of identifying um, some sort of award uh, for uh, research in what I might call David's own particular area. Um, so uh, I don't know about scale or nature of that award, but if you did want uh, a memory of David Smallbone and the, the areas that he covered, then I think something, uh, some form of maybe annual award um, covering the area of what I would call institutions, policy and entrepreneurship would be a nice area which captured his contribution. Thank you very much. And I'm gonna give it back to uh, Robert Blackburn as well because we did have this conversation and. Uh, us three with Robert and David about a special award for, for David. And we wanted to see if his family was okay with this award or not. But maybe Robert, you can jump in as well and maybe something collectively that we can come out of this webinar all together saying this is something that we should all look into together and with his family to make sure that they're okay with it. Robert, what do you think? I think it would be um, a, a wonderful gesture. Um, of course, we can think through the details. Um, I think also we need to bear in mind, David was very much, he was international, but he was very much also locally focused. For example, we did a piece of work recently um, on EU policy, on a particular uh, aspect of EU policy. And, and David was very, never forgot his roots. David would always say, you cannot have generic policies. This was one of his big themes. So as much as he was very internationally focused and orientated, he would never ever forget the grassroots. Um, and in many respects, David was quite humble. And therefore, I think having some sort of award that could embrace those different characteristics would be, would be very, very worthwhile. 
I'm sure his family, I, I've, I've, um, I've spoken with his helper, his carer, who's still working hard and um, even, even in David's death, he's generating a lot of work around him. His helper's busy um, arranging things and I can discuss this with her. And his wife, Margaret, let's not forget his, his loving wife, Margaret. She's um, obviously, I've not, I've not really, I phoned her once and left a message, but I will get back to her at some point. I don't think there's a problem there. I think they'd be delighted. Um, I hope I'm not jumping the gun, but I can't see why uh, they would object. I'm sure they would give it, give it their blessing. Thank you. Thank you. And maybe I'll, I'll, I'll ask Professor Kirby his thoughts and maybe also Federica after Professor Kirby, if he's available still. Professor Kirby? Yes, Simon. Yes. What are your thoughts moving forward about the idea of the award? I think an award would be absolutely outstanding. I mean, um, he, he contributed a great deal, not just to academia, but to other people as well. And I think if we had something which um, could celebrate his achievements, his life, his research, and his genuine um, concern for other people. Uh, what you were talking earlier about stories about David, I hadn't seen David for some time. And he, um, when I met him, he, he told me that he uh, got Parkinson's and I was very um, concerned about it but he wasn't he he's he, you know the vitality in him he was more concerned that i was concerned than than he was concerned about himself he was he he was going to fight it and he was going to continue as he had done before and if we could get a an award which celebrated not just his achievements but his concern for other people i think that would be something excellent Frederica, your thoughts about this? Um, I, I like the idea David's story put um, to the group here, actually, that it should be something concerned with what was at David's heart, like institutions, policies, and entrepreneurship. I would like to add something to that. Also, when it comes to other people, think of all those um, more junior people he mentored through um, academia and think of the people who probably actually stayed in academia because David gave them some input and gave them some, some, some benefit and, and some reason for staying in academia in Central and Eastern Europe. So maybe focus the, such an award a bit more on those areas which we tend to neglect um, could be uh, emerging countries, could be developing countries, could be junior people, and make it an award David would be really, really proud of. Um, thank you, thank you. Um, what I'd like to do now is, um, as we put this uh, to, to wrap here, is maybe I'll go back to Professor Kirby with some closing uh, remarks or points that he likes to share, and I'll go to I'll go to Federica, and then David, and then. Um, and then Robert and I will end it then, if that's okay. So Professor Kirby, last comment? I think it's all been said really. Um, uh, we've lost uh, an outstanding scholar and lost a, a tremendous colleague. And I think Frederica's point, you know, he mentored and helped so many other people. And if we could get something which celebrated that achievement, then I think it would be um, it's certainly very fitting for ICSB and for David himself. Thank you. Um, Federica, your, your thoughts? Last comment? Yeah. Um, we lost a friend as well, and um, Rob mentioned it, or I think David Story mentioned it earlier. There will be a point coming out um, very soon, and it's very fitting that this is a research agenda and entrepreneurship policies because this is something which is at David's heart. Thank you. And um, David? I genuinely don't think I have uh, anything, anything else to add. I think it's um, uh, all been said um, in most cases uh, rather better than I've said it. So I'm going to finish at that point. Thank you. And Robert, um, last comments and words? Thank you, Eamon. Thank you, um, the Davids and Frederica. Um, selfishly, um, 
I've lost a friend and a colleague. I think for the community more widely, um, David has left a legacy. Um, his publications are there for everyone to see. He's um, shared his experiences through mentoring with numerous people, to numerous dimension, with colleagues internationally. Um, I certainly will always carry um, a piece of David with me when I'm working. And I'll never ever forget that twinkle in his eye when he was about to contradict what I would say. I'm sure he'd be contradicting what I'm saying now if he, <laughs> if he was able to. Um, so I, I, I'd say, good, I'd say goodbye to David with a smile, but I think it's important that we do honour the legacy. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, on behalf of ICSB, we want to thank you all for coming here. I think ICSB will remember David from the words that you all have used and shared with us and the great stories that you have done. And on behalf of the ICSB board, we are very delighted to work with our ECSB partners and other organizations to work with us on an award to recognize David and across the board. I hope this is a start of something special for David with this award that we can collectively come together and share across all platforms and organizations. And I'll share, um, we share our condolences with um, David's uh, family and, and loved ones. He'll be greatly missed. He was a great human being and, and we celebrate him and we celebrate his life and also we will work hard to make sure that he's always be remembered in terms of research, policy, helping the young people. And I wanna thank you all for coming today. This has been, meant a lot to me personally, knowing David, but also to ICSB and all his loved ones worldwide. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, we'll end the webinar now. Have a wonderful day, everybody. Thank you very much.